that say morning. Good to be here in the house of the Lord today. Beautiful day the Lord's given to us. Some folks not here today. A little sickness going on here and there. Some folks away on vacation, family reunion and such. Uh, Mom and dad even went to West Virginia this past week. Brother Dave drove for them, and they're on their way back, so 
Pray that the Lord would keep them. Amen. And uh, God's been good to us, and we're excited about living for the Lord. Amen. Nehemiah chapter number 2, verses 17 and 18 is where we're going to be uh, reading from in just a moment. Nehemiah chapter 1, a little paraphrase of those first four verses. Nehemiah says, I am the son of Hakaliah, and these are my words, and this is my story. During the months of November, December of the 20th year of Artaxerxes' reign, I was in the palace there in Susa. When one of my brothers came from Judah, along with some other men, and they asked about the Jews, or I asked about the Jews who had survived the exile, and about our city, Jerusalem. And the, the answer basically was that it's a disaster. The place is a disaster. The survivors that are there in Jerusalem have been in great distress and reproach. They've been wronged and they've been hated. And he, they went on to say that the walls of the city or the wall of the city of Jerusalem is broken down and all the gates are destroyed by fire. And upon hearing this, he said, I was overwhelmed with grief and sorrow and all I could do is just sit and weep. He said, for days I mourned the news that I heard. I, I sought the audience of the true God of heaven. I, I wanted to talk to God about this. And so he began to pray and fast. And Nehemiah chapter number 2 starts giving us a little more history of what was going on. 11 through 13, it says, so I, I went to Jerusalem. And I was there three days, and I arose in the middle of the night, myself and a few men with me, told no one others what uh, God had put in my heart to do there at Jerusalem. He said, there was no animal with me except the one which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent wall and the refuse gate, and I viewed the walls of Jerusalem. He was on a surveying mission, I guess. I, I viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and its gates, which were burned with fire. He sees all of this. So I bring you to Nehemiah chapter 2, 17 and 18, where it says, I said unto them, the people, and the survivors, the remnant. He said, you see the distress that we are in? And how that Jerusalem lies in waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And he challenges them and said, Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that there be no more reproach. Then I told them of the hand of God, which was good upon me, and also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Just a little history here of the brokenness of this city of Jerusalem and the desire of a man to see that built back, to see it restored or revived. The Exodus chapter number 34, verses 5 and 6. This is after the breaking of the first tablets of the Ten Commandments by Moses. He broke those because of the sin and insurrection of the people against the living God and went into idol worship and all that was there that day and cast the tablets down and broke them. And God has mercy and grace to the children of Israel and he says we'll give you a second chance here and he gets a second set of tablets and 
Exodus 34, 5 and 6 says this, And the Lord descended in the cloud, stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. The declaration, I am the Lord, I'm the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in mercy, abundant in goodness, and abundant in truth. I want to put these together just a little bit here today and talk to us about the walls of mercy and grace. The walls of mercy and grace. Lord, I pray that you touch our hearts here today. Lord, your spirit would just move in this house and that you would strengthen your people that have gathered in, that you would keep them, that you'd protect them, and bless them, Lord, abundantly, and we'll give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Nehemiah said, upon hearing this report, I was over- overwhelmed with grief, and all I could do was sit down and weep. For many days I mourned the news and I sought the audience of the true God of heaven, praying and fasting before him. As Nehemiah surveyed the city, his his heart was broken. He was grieved. His mind went back to how things used to be. The grandeur of the city was still in his mind. It's kind of like when we were brought up maybe in a particular place and maybe the surroundings that we had were something that kind of just impressed upon us, some kind of a picture, something that was big, something that was, you know, exciting or or something of that nature, but when we came back. After we were older, it wasn't near as bright and big and grand as what it seemed before. Nehemiah, in much the same way, comes back to the city. And it's not that the city wasn't grand in its day, but it was broken down. So it wasn't just something in his mind mind's eye that was reduced and kind of uh, just put into a place of obscureness in his mind or spirit. No, this was something that stood out to him. It was something that was real, and it was something that affected him so much. The grandeur of the city, as he looked, wasn't there. Underneath his feet was the rubble of how things used to be and what used to be there. So much had changed, and so much was lost. The walls of Jerusalem were broken down, still broken down, I should say, because about a half a century before this time period, from my understanding, there was the rebuilding of the temple. And the, the temple was destroyed also in that, that overtaking Babylon that, that took over and destroyed the city and destroyed the temple and, and all, that was, all that was there. And the temple was rebuilt, but the walls were left for quite some time after. And... For Nehemiah, the connection between the temple and I believe even for us today and the wall is very significant. It was significant in their day and it's significant in our day for the theology of the church and what we truly believe. The the temple might seem to be that religious institution, right? I mean, that's the temple. While that the walls... What does it really matter so much? You know, that's more on a natural plane or a secular level or something of that nature. 
But God led Nehemiah to, to work on these walls. And I believe no less than he had Ezra to work on the temple. Because both the temple and the walls were necessary to, fill, to fulfill God's plan and desire to restore and revive the nation of Israel. If the walls were unfinished, then the temple was unfinished. The work was more of a single piece than it was a dual action. And the reason for this is easy for us to understand because we know that without a wall, speaking about the, the cities of ancient times anyway, and especially in the Near East, that if there were no walls, there was really no safety. Bandits, wild animals, gangs, and even though the entire empire might be in peace and it might be calm, there was, there was always the threat of something coming in and disrupting the peace within the city. But the walls, the walls prevented that. And the walls kept out the, the things that would come in to destroy, but it also, so it, it, gave, it gave this protection for the people that lived in it, in the city. And the more economically and culturally developed the city became, the more value there was within the city, right? And the more banks that they had opened up and, you know, the more restaurants that were thriving and flourishing and, you know, the, the dealerships and and all of these furniture stores and, and everything that a city has to offer. In their day, that's what it kind of represented, the marketplace. And the more developed it became, the more valuable the things in that location became. And without there being any walls to, to protect, Along with that value, it becomes more and more vulnerable to those that would want to take it away. And of course, the temple, with all of the rich decorations that were in it, all of the gold that was there, would have been at a high risk also. Practically speaking, no wall means no city. No city means no temple. And so when Nehemiah looked, this, looked at this, he sat down and he wept and he fasted and prayed before God that there would be a restoration of that wall and those gates. There needed to be something to remedy the situation because there were things that were in peril and at risk. And as he is concerned about what is going on and the, and the danger, I suppose we could put it that way, there came a burden upon him. There, there came this intense desire to restore and to revive what was once but now was not. For 52 days, in that 52-day period, they have to remove all of the rubble. You see, after the enemy came in, it was just tear down and it was just destroy. There wasn't removing necessarily. There was breaking down and leaving all of the junk all over the place, and it had been there for years. So in that 52-day period that we read about in the rebuilding of the walls there of Jerusalem, it all happened in 52 days. 
to remove all of the junk and rebuild and make new. And you say, well, that's not that big of a deal if you're putting a fence maybe around, you know, some acres or something like that. But this particular wall, from my understanding, is a wall that was about averaged at 40 feet high. There might have been a place or two that was a little lower, some higher, but average of 40 feet high. And the average of 8 feet wide, and it was 2.5 miles long. And so they rebuilt the walls at the rate of 250 feet per day, thereabouts, which is an astonishing feat. It really is. But it goes to show us of just how much God can do through us. Hey, it doesn't take us long to look around and see our world for what it is, and it's in a mess. It needs needs some help. And the church needs to be that place of safety, that place of security, that place where someone can come And not just necessarily the church building, but I understand our concept of getting people together. And we get together many times in the church house. And we worship God together and we pray together, much like the day of Pentecost. So coming to church is not a bad thing. It's not something that's, you know, irrelevant in our day or anything like that. But I will say this, our church is not just here in the four walls of this building. We are here today gathered together and it's important and we worship and we praise and we magnify God. And there are exceeding great and precious promises that God has given to us. Some of those promises I see quite often in their fulfillment. Many times, you know, I I see the forgiveness of God working Amongst us, I see people as they are baptized in Jesus' name, and I see them as they are filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And it's an awesome experience in a a miracle that we are able to enjoy. But there are other things that I want to see, and there are other things that I desire to see that when the sick and the lame and the blind come in and they're healed, that the word of God goes forth with much power and anointing and and it begins to touch the hearts of people and immediately people respond to what they've heard. They're baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. We all want to see the miraculous and the miracles and signs and wonders. We, We want to see God doing what God does within our church, within our community. And I think that many times we observe and we take our survey. And we think, well, we could probably do a little better, right? We could probably do a little better, and we could probably have a, a little bit more happening in, in the spiritual part of a person's life within our community. There are many souls that are in our, just our community that need this gospel today. And there needs to be that drawing of the Spirit of the Lord and my heart is burdened for a, an area that most of the people do not know the Lord Jesus. And they need to know Him. And so I pray, I pray earnestly that there would be the drawing of the Spirit. You don't know how many times that I will pray during the day, during the week, and ask God, God, would you just draw people, draw people to your church. Not just this location, but to the church, the body of Christ. Draw them to us that, that we're able to, to be able to share the, the gospel. And we're able to share with them the love of Christ. You see, God has chosen us to be the ambassadors. Chosen by the foolishness of preaching and teaching. That we somehow reach our generation. And I, I, but I know that, that lest the Spirit draw them, that, that they really will not come. And, and I'm looking for those that are hungry and thirsting after righteousness and And so I want these things to be restored, restored in us. Now, 
there was an anointing, or there was a, an unction, if you please, upon Nehemiah's heart that basically said that this is something you can do, and this is something that I'm going to equip you and give you favor to be able to, to have those walls to be rebuilt and restored. This anointing came from God, the Almighty God. It was more than just some charisma that, that Nehemiah had. There was anointing upon his life. It was, it was more than just having maybe some... He, Nehemiah really wasn't uh, poor, okay? Uh, he had a good position. Yeah, he did. He, he was in the palace, and he was the king's cupbearer, and he, he made and done well by the position that he had. So it wasn't that he was a slouch by any means and, you know, just a peasant or anything like that. No. He was influential and he had a good name among the people. But it went further than that. There was this anointing that came upon him, an anointing that was poured out upon him. It was like a covering. And it was something that was equipping him for the task that was ahead. And I believe as we desire to see God move in our midst, that there's an anointing that will come over us from God because of a desire within our hearts to see revival. Yes, revival. I, I, I do not equate revival with outpouring. I separate the two, as many of you know. Revival, to me, is, is bringing back in the church what was once there. And the, the power and the authority. And, and, so, and, and so then I, I go ahead, when I see people coming in, I, I look at that as an outpouring of the Spirit, okay? Uh, you can look at revival any way you want to, but I'll just explain that to you as to how I feel when it comes to this restoration. I want to see revival within the church, within the ministry, amen, within our churches, amen, a revival of love and compassion like that we have never, ever experienced before, a, a, a work of God moving through us, amen, and in miracles and signs and wonders and all of those different things. But above all else, I want us all to be like Jesus to the best of our ability, amen. And so we read about this anointing that came upon Nehemiah. And as we, as we speak of this anointing, that anointing is upon us as well. But there's a, a little different or deeper anointing, and it's referred to in the Scripture as an unction. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy One. I believe that's even a greater anointing because that anointing is an anointing that's actually kind of rubbed in to us. It's more than something that's just poured over us, right? The Spirit of Christ is in us. The anointing that would have been upon Nehemiah as a child of God, as a prophet of God, was something that came upon him. And I recognize that he was very influential and he did great things for the Lord. But I also understand that in the last days, through the plan of God, that God decided and his plan was not that he would just be moving upon someone or just kind of influencing them or even surrounding them, but that his real intent and desire is to be in us, to be in us. Many people come into the presence of God and they feel the presence of God. They feel the touch of God. And many times that's what it is that attracts them to our music. Because when they come in and we begin to sing, 
And we begin to sing as the Spirit of God in us, <laughs> right? Some people have told me before, hey, I went to this concert, and they began to sing, you know, Amazing Grace, and I felt the presence of God. Of course you did. It wasn't about the thousands of people that may have been there that were <laughs> carnal as the day is long. It was about the Spirit of God that was dwelling in you and your relationship with God. And when you begin to sing it, and those words begin to resonate within your mind and heart, yes, you did. You felt the presence of God. But don't mistake that for some kind of, you know, approval or God condoning the lifestyle of many people that sing some of the same songs that we sing. They will feel the presence of God when they come into our churches or, or some other event and we begin to worship the Lord. They feel something. A few weeks back, a man standing behind, beside his trailer and his equipment telling me of some things that were going on in his, in his body and he needed healing and he was, he was on the list for, I believe, a, a, a double lung transplant and, and, and such. And I said, can we pray right now? And he said, well, yeah, let's pray. And so we prayed, and, and we called on the Lord to touch him. And he felt the presence of God in that place, in that open, I guess say place. It was a spot by, in the road. He felt the presence of God. So they will feel it. But that doesn't take them to the dimension that God truly wants for them to experience his presence, and that is Christ in us, yes. the hope of glory. God desires not for there just to be this, this splashing over of his presence and power, but that there would be within the people his spirit. Amen. That anointing that we have today is an anointing that is inside of us. It's something that gets rubbed in. Amen. And you and your effectiveness, our effectiveness, I believe, relies upon how much we want that anointing to be rubbed in. <laughs> you know, sometimes God rubs you the wrong way. I know he does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he begins to talk to you a little bit about maybe some of the attitudes that you have and he said, God's not worried about, you know, what I'm thinking and such. And, you know, really? You, have, you read Matthew 20, uh, chapter 5 and talks about the, the, you know, blessed are the those that like a pure in spirit, poor in spirit, and, and all of those different things and how the, the blessing of the Lord is. God is very concerned about what, what's going on in your heart and life. Very, very concerned. And God wants to. To move in and through us. And so how, how long will we stay in the presence of God to let the, let the spirit and the power of God to soak in to this old carnal man? <laughs> you stay in the presence of Jesus long enough, you're going to start looking like him, acting like him, talking like him. And they'll notice that you've been with Jesus. They will. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. It really isn't. It really isn't. It's not a bad thing to be like Jesus. But God anoints us. To do specific things. The anointing of God is not just about us feeling good. And these anointings that are available to people today, not just to me and not just to you, but really to everyone. You'll read in the Bible that there's an anointing for cleansing. Yeah. You read about it in the the book of Leviticus, it talks about the anointing oil upon the priest's hand and how that he shall put that upon the head of the one that is needing to be cleansed to make an atonement for him. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an anointing for us to, to be saved. And I certainly want that anointing, and I believe you do as well. You want to be saved. Amen. And then there's this, this anointing to... To be able to serve God. 
And we read about that in the book of Exodus, talks about Aaron and how that the, the garments are holy upon him and anointing upon him and the sanctification that is upon him. And all of this is there that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And what he's talking about is serving God. To be able to serve the Lord. <laughs> There's anointing today for us to be able to serve God. And then we read about another anointing. And that comes to us from 1 Samuel chapter number 10. Where Samuel took a vial of oil, poured it upon his head and kissed him and said... Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? And Samuel was asking Saul, what is your anointing really for? What are you going to do with it? And what that anointing represents is us being able to, to help others. So God anoints us to be saved, anoints us to be able to live for him, and anoints us to make an impact within our world and to help other people. So I'm talking to a group of people today that as you have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, been baptized in His name, repented, as you have done that, there's an anointing upon your life. And, and that anointing in these three areas that I've just mentioned to you takes us to the place as to what are we supposed to be doing. And so let me go back to Jerusalem for just a few moments here. The walls of Jerusalem represent the strength of God, but they also represent the strength of the people that live within that city. And when you understand that when the Bible is talking about Jerusalem, that there is a connection. There's this natural Israel and there's this spiritual Israel. That's a, there's a natural chosen people and there's a spiritually chosen people. And you can look into the scripture and you can find the similarities in some of the things that apply to us in a spiritual sense. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. From this time forth and forevermore. Is that just for the Jewish population of a city in Israel? Or does it go beyond that? To his spiritual people. That the Lord will surround us. Protect us and keep us. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen. All the day and all the night, they shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest. We understand the importance of the watchmen. We understand the importance of those that will cry out. The Lord working in us and through us and strengthening us. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, and shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Friend, let me tell you something. I am so thankful, amen, that I can look back into some of these verses of Scripture, the Old Testament Scriptures, that many people say, that's really not for us today, but I find in them the application. I am so glad that I am a child of God, and He is coming, and He's righteous, and He has salvation. Amen. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. 
You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called my delight is in her and you, your land married. For the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. <laughs> One more. Moses says, so terrible was the sight. I exceedingly fear and quake. But the apostle said, you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Which begs the question, do we know who we are? Do we know who we are? And do we know where we're at? Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? You're not your own. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. <laughs> what a beautiful application. We understand the city set on the hill. He's referring to Jerusalem. But in our case, he's talking about the church. He's talking about us as the people of God. There's a bright light shining in us, through us. There's a fire upon us as the people of God. We can make an impact. Amen upon a world that's lost. The walls of mercy and grace. His name is in this place. He said, I have chosen Jerusalem that my name may be there forever. Speaking of David, he said, I chose you to be over my people. He said, my name is going to be there in Jerusalem forever. You know, forever is a long time, they say. So forever means now. Forever, the name of the Almighty God is upon that place. In the natural sense. Because that's what he said. I, I don't see any recanting of that statement. But understanding for us today that the name of the Lord is upon us. And you say, is that really going to make a difference? Well, ask the world, is it going to make a difference? It is going to make a difference because you're going to be hated of all men for my, my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. His name is in that place, in that city surrounded by the walls of mercy and grace. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Think about this for just a moment. Are you going to go into that natural temple? Are you going to go in there and desecrate the temple? And they did in the day. But the judgment of God also came against them because of it. We're the temple of God. And that name, that's above every name, where there's no salvation in any other, that name of Jesus. Within those walls, there's that place of protection. The place where that you can, stand with me, where you can take your promises that God's given to you and you can keep them in that place. And I go back to Abraham. 
How many times was he promised it? His family, his kingdom. He was going to be a great nation. Matter of fact, through him, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. But there came a day. There came a day when God came to Abraham and said, Take thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I'll tell you of. And I can hear, it's not recorded, so I got a little imagination. I can hear Abraham saying, maybe under his, under his breath, maybe just in his mind, but God, you said. But you said. You, you said, get out of the country. I got out of the country. To go to a land that you'd show me, and I went to a land that you showed me. You told me that you'd make of me a great nation and blessing, name great, and be in a blessing. You promised that you'd bless them that bless me and curse them that curse me. You said, you said. And when God spoke to Abraham, he he recognized, he just recognized the voice of God. And he took God at his word. For when God said, take thy son, thine only son, he recognized the importance of the word only. There would not be one before, right? Because there was an Ishmael and God said, nope. So if there was not going to be one before, there would not be one after. Isaac was the one, and God, you promised, and you said. And in that place, there was the protection of the promise that God gave to him. Within those walls of mercy and grace, power. God. Bible says tempting Abraham and Abraham understood he said I don't know how it's all going to happen but you promised me a great nation through Isaac and if you have to resurrect him from the dead that's how it's going to be but Isaac's going to live on now some people and I'll close with this they believe that Walls can be seen as a source of imprisonment and division. And they're oftentimes referred to as things that we need to break down and overcome. And I understand that. I'm not just saying. However, when we look at the walls in the Bible, they are also seen as structures to protect, to provide security, to represent a place of shelter, and form a sense of belonging. This world's in a serious trouble, terrible situation. But for those that are of the household of faith, everything is going to be all right. Within those walls of mercy and grace, everything is going to be all right. You don't understand, Pastor. Oh, yes, I do understand. I understand that the promise of God is that everything will work out for my good. I understand that the steps are ordered by the Lord. I understand he said he'd never leave, never forsake. And that if I would trust him, he would bring me through the circumstances and situations of life. <laughs> we have a covenant of protection. We have a place of safety. And that place is within those walls. I want us to I want us to pray right now. Jesus, I thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace and your power. You're my shield and buckler. 
You protect me in front, and you protect me from behind. <laughs> you are my circle of protection. Oh, God, I thank you for your blood today. God, I pray that we would plead your blood over the circumstances and situations that we face in this life. God, let us to recognize the power that's in your name and the promise, God, that your angels would encamp about us and keep us safe. These are just some of the things that the, the walls of mercy and grace will incorporate into your life if you will allow the spirit and the power of the Lord to touch you today. Go ahead, let's sing and let's just worship him for a few moments here today. How sweet. God, let us to walk into those places of safety and security. Let us, oh God, to step into the circumference of that wall of mercy and grace that you have provided for us through your blood. I Found God, I'm a shut, Bobo, shut, I don't know how much. 